I'm Barry Farber. Did you ever have the experience of sitting on flat ground and all of a sudden finding yourself on top of a big flaming mountain because a volcano exploded under you? Well, sounds kind of uncomfortable, but I did it in the right way. I met, well, th let me just tell you who I met before he became what. First, one beautiful summer night in the mid-1970s, I was walking through Manhattan's theater district down Schubert Alley, that marvelous little alley that connects 45th Street to 44th Street. And there's always something going on in New York, and particularly that part of New York all the time. What was going on that evening was a cute, puckish, faced, baby-faced kind of young man on a unicycle, just a plain old unicycle. And he was entertaining everybody. He could make that unicycle hop, sing, dance, jump, wiggle, and everybody was having so much fun watching this little acrobat uh, on that unicycle. So I'm always on the lookout for good material. I uh, said, excuse me, my name is Barry Farber. I do a radio program. Would you come and talk about uh, what you are doing over it? Turns out he was French. And he came to my broadcast, I think, that night. And I talked about what a tremendous plus it was to have nice people doing fun things in New York City to entertain everybody. And uh, I asked what he really uh, uh, would like to do, and he told me. And I said, uh-huh, good, good luck. And that was the end of it. I guess by two days later, I'd forgotten his name. All of a sudden, I was awakened one morning by the biggest man in New York radio, John Gambling himself. John Gambling called me and said, Barry, did you interview Philippe Petit? And I was just waking up. I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, oh, you mean, no, I don't think, oh, yeah, the French guy on the unicycle. I couldn't understand why John Gambling, he knew I slept, he knew my late night schedule. Why would John Gambling get me out of bed early one morning to ask me if I had interviewed a unicycle acrobat from France? I said, yes, John, I, I, you know, I did, so what, whatever, why, how come? Well, I'd forgotten, you see, what Philippe Petit said he was really over here for. It was something about tight rope walking between two high places. And while John Gambling was on the radio and while I was sleeping, my Philippe Petit, my unicyclist from France, had done literally the impossible. He, with a secret team, I wish the French resistance had had more crews like that working that effectively against the Nazis during World War II. But Philippe Petit and his underground team had all of a sudden strung out a wire between the two towers of the World Trade Center and Philippe Petit in defiance of the law, in defiance of the city law, in defiance of uh, statutory law, in defiance of natural laws, in defiance of all laws of human nature. Philippe Petit had walked from the top of one of those towers on his own little unofficial jerry-built voluntarily amateurishly strung up i'm not saying amateurishly i take that back what i mean is uh, it wasn't official it didn't have police permits and people checking it and everything they had to do it illegally you see he had walked from one of those towers to the other on his own tightrope and john gambling wanted to know where to get in touch with philippe petit and i was happy to see philippe petit become famous philippe petit you're the only person who i'm happy to see become famous by breaking the law. You broke the law, didn't you? The way you tell this story is beautiful and you're a natural actor. Um, I will never forget the way uh, we met before and the way we met after. And um, actually I met you again in uh, Battery Park. That's right. You were doing yeah. some political uh, campaigning. Right. Absolutely. And um, to me again was a first, like I, for the first time of my life, I talked in my circle as a street juggler because you just came in and you were so happy to see me and you yeah. tell everyone who I was and I just say thank you or something which was the first word I ever spoke in 20 years as a street juggler uh, like if Marcel Marceau will turn on stage and say hello <laughs> you know um, and since then yes many things happened I became more of a high wire walker I became a writer and I draw and uh, I do theater and I have big projects and I'm still a street juggler so I see here one of your projects on the broadcast table right now Philippe Petit on the High Wire, translated by Paul Allister, prefaced by Marcel Marceau. These are all pictures from your stunts and your feats and everything, plus a lot of stuff from ancient Parisian circuses. The hill, here's an old 
high wire act across Niagara Falls. Let's go back to the beginning because it's been a long time since you told the story. When did you first conceive of walking? Not forget the World Trade Center, save that for later. When did you first conceive of walking between two points where if you fell, it would be the end of you? Well, I think it became very, it came naturally. I never really conceived of it. I was a child from six to 12, um, jumping from trees to trees and climbing and uh, with the help of a rope. And as a child, I would do many things with that rope. And one day without even thinking of it, I did what you would call a monkey bridge, a couple of ropes in between two trees, one for the feet, one for the hand, and you walk across. Oh, that's easy. Uh, that's easy, yeah. kind of easy. And uh, one day <coughs> I, I just took the top rope away and I, for fun, I tried to walk on the bottom rope just with my feet on that rope like wire walkers do. And I must have heard about wire walkers, but I didn't really uh, see too many of them. And this was mingling with me doing a lot of arts, a lot of sports, a lot of disciplines. As a child, I was lucky that my parents put me into many schooling uh, where I learned all those arts and sports. And all that mingled together um, made me a little bit, uh, <laughs> I would say, disrespect authority and go into climbing more trees, more rocks, and playing with more ropes. So from 6 to 12, with all this this uh, thing going on, and around 12, 15, I decided I wanted to become a magician, a juggler, and a high wire walker. But there was no school at the time for that. So I learned all those three disciplines by myself, which in itself is a very unique fact for a young uh, person to do. Uh, nowadays, as you know, you have many schools in different countries uh, for the one who wish to become a juggler, for example. So this self uh, uh, brought me in a unique way um, and uh, again I was not a, a normal wire worker I start writing about it and I start uh, imagining uh, incredible uh, wire walks and along came the thought that sometimes most of the time nobody will let me do it and that's how the illegal walks came out when was the first time you took a walk, a high wire walk, where if you'd fallen, it would have been too bad? You see, I'm good at forgetting questions, and that was your question. So, the first time, it's actually Notre Dame, which is my first illegal walk That's as in well. That's book, On the High Wire. Yes, um, the 27th of June. Uh, 71. Well, that was illegal too? I thought, oh, yeah. the, I thought the French had a good Gallic <laughs> romantic soul. Maybe, I well, I thought they would never say yes. Now if I ask, maybe they would have to say yes. But, oh, uh, I thought the priest calls the foreign ministry <laughs> and the foreign ministry calls the foreign legion and there's all right. kinds of history and macho and everything. I thought the French would never stand in the way of a high wire walk. Well, now they actually don't because the Ministry of Culture invited me to do an immense show on the high wire in front of the Eiffel Tower last year and it's also a very big picture in my collection of mm. photographs. But uh, at the time, I, I was a street juggler and only that. So I had to fly with my own wings. Mm. Once the French, uh, the French really impressed the press of the world. There, 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 there is a difference in the French. We should notice differences of different countries and enjoy those differences. We're afraid of differences. We're afraid if you admit there's a certain difference in any nationality, people will say, oh, that's bigotry. People, yeah, differences have been used by bigots, but that should not block us forever from enjoying differences. Uh, the, the bigots win if we are intimidated away from enjoying the differences. Let me tell you a big French difference. No other country in the world would do this. It's only the French. There was a cable car in the French Alps that got stuck uh, between two mountain peaks. and You know, one of these funicular cars. And it was stuck there for 18 hours. And the press had time to come up from Paris and watch the rescue operation. And the, um, uh, the foreign newsman, of course, wanted the names of the people on the uh, cable car. And the French authorities would not divulge the names. And the Americans said, why? They're not being held hostage. Uh, everybody's OK. They got everybody down OK. Why won't you give us the names of those in the cable car? And the French said, I'm sorry. How do we know that everybody on that cable car is there with the person that that person is supposed to be on cable cars with? Ah, the French were not about to betray <laughs> that a man might be on the cable car with his mistress or his lover, or his girlfriend or whatever his <laughs> wife might say. They didn't want any wife to get upset by seeing a husband who said he was somewhere else that day instead of on the cable. The French were gallant and they were discreet. So, uh, did you attract a crowd when you walked between the two towers of Notre Dame? Yes, not an enormous crowd. It was a bit chilly morning, it was early. But uh, yes, 
as all my illegal walks at the beginning, it's a surprise. You lift your head and then two, five hundred people do, and then it becomes a two thousand people crowd. I'm usually not interested in technology, but I am interested in how an illegal wire is uh, strung out efficiently enough to support a real tight rope walk at those altitudes where it can sometimes get a little bit windy. We'll, oh, it, we'll, we'll, it is. we'll talk about the wind. Mm -hmm. Every time I go up in the World Trade Center and feel wind against the, the window panes, I, I think of Philippe Petit. We'll be right back. First, I'm Barry Farber, and I am prepared not to like brash daredevils. When they're brash and daredeviling in what they do, they're usually brash and daredeviling with people around them, and that kind of attitude turns me off. However, heights, heights weed out bad unkind daredevils, impolite daredevils, tacky daredevils. I think they stay on the ground, motorcycles and stuff. I have never met two nicer people in my life than Philippe Petit and George Willig, and they both achieved fame, uh, Philippe Petit, by walking between the two towers of the World Trade Center, and later, as an encore, uh, uh, George Willig climbing <laughs> the face of uh, one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Philippe, Let's go to Notre Dame. We'll save the big drum at the World Trade Center for later. How do you, without permission, get a wire tight enough between two spires on top of Notre Dame Cathedral to support a walk? Well, there's no recipe for that, and I must say that in each case of my major illegal walks, I have done several of them around the world, each time it was a matter of years of preparation. So I actually spent three years uh, preparing for the Notre Dame caper. <laughs> uh, the preparation involved disguising myself, doing a survey of the towers, measuring everything, taking pictures, making false keys, all those nice little uh, mm. unlawful uh, items. And then one day I came there surprisingly uh, with just one friend and with a little fishing line and one of the juggling balls that I use as a street juggler in the street. And I threw the ball across uh, and the fishing line was followed by a heavier line, then by a rope, and at the end of the night by the walking cable. And then it was a matter of uh, another 10 hours to fasten that to special ratchet, tight it, it's never tight enough, and then I step at that time, almost as a kid, I was 20 years old, on the most dangerous, crazy wire ever, because I was uh, 250 feet in the air, and previously I was uh, 20 feet in the air. So that was my first uh, amazing walk, and uh, since then I have <laughs> walked a lot. Mm. Did you get thrown into the Bastille by an angry um, Paris constabulary? Yes and no. I was uh, brought to the nearest precinct, and I was asked uh, a lot of questions because they were intrigued. Yeah. Uh, actually, I helped putting the cable down because the rescue squadron were entangling themselves with my ropes, and they finally accepted my help. And uh, then I was an instant hero in France, and I returned to street juggling that very night when I was released from jail. And uh, people will stand up at the cafe and applaud, you know, standing ovation oh, as a street performer. Really? Really? <laughs> and then, of course, I did the usual uh, um, press uh, press shows. And then um, I found out that France was not interested in seeing more wires on, in their skies. So then I say, well, if France is not interested, I have the whole world left, and I went to America. I don't remember when I first saw my picture of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, do you remember when you first saw a picture of the twin towers of the World Trade Center? I remember very well, and it is um, in, in a future book called WTC, uh, the initials for World Trade Center, which also is a screenplay because it's a natural film. And this time we're not talking about three years, but nine years. I spent nine years of my life doing a very, at times, sophisticated, scientific, uh, illegal preparation. And uh, again, I forgot your question. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, no. I, I just want uh, to okay, know. I, just I want to know if you remember seeing your first. Oh yes. Movie. Well, that is the beginning of that film or that story. Is that I was at a dentist in Paris in 1967, um, with my hand on my on my uh, cheek, and then I was browsing through magazine. Uh, old magazine, you know, in dentists you never have the current one, you have the one of two months ago. When in the France too? Yes, when the family of the dentist finally finished yeah. reading it. So here I was, and I saw, uh, it was a Paris match actually, and I saw a big drawing, not a picture, because the building didn't exist, ah. it was ten years earlier, but I saw a big um, architecture rendering of two enormous towers, and the caption was saying in French something like, once they will be built, these towers will become the highest in the world. Now this was for me, and I needed that picture very badly, and I, so what I did, I 
I looked around and there was all these old ladies in beautiful armchair and there was silence, very heavy silence. And I, you know, when you cough, people will turn to you like, you know, French people are. So I said, how can I get this? And finally what I did, I leaned back and I did an enormous sneeze. And during the sneeze, I ripped the page of the magazine, threw it into my shirt. And of course, I had to find another dentist. So that's the beginning of the story. And I, it would be a scene in a movie, a scene in a movie one day. And since then, it actually took me nine years from the moment I put my feet on this wire. And during these nine years, it's actually an in incredible story made of betrayals, made of uh, ups and downs, miracles. Uh, I had no money. I had friends come from Australia, from France, from uh, uh, North uh, Africa to help me to rig the wire. Um, I was caught by the police a month before. I did incredible. I, I almost developed the story. And, and I uh, actually, in, in, in your show just before the walk, I was actually almost saying what I was going to do, but I succeeded in holding my tongue and saying, I will walk and surprise New York and these two enormous buildings, but I didn't really tell you when and where. So this is all part of the story. Actually, in, in my book, I talk about our encounter because it was very unusual, you know. I'm in your book? Uh, not in this one. This, uh, this oh, current book I, is, is more of a discourse about highway walking. I'm talking about the screenplay of I'm WTC. I'm going to be on WTC? Yes, I hope you will play yourself. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, good. I, I don't know if I can play myself with any fidelity or not, but I try. <laughs> you must know. Well, you should pass the audition anyway. <laughs> okay. You must know or you know of the Bulgarian artist Christo. Of course, I know him, and we have crossed paths, and we have talked about future possible collaboration. <laughs> like, he will put a curtain, and I will walk on the line before I pull the curtain oh, wow. of a valley. Well, Christo had hundreds of volunteers. He could have had thousands to, to, uh, uh, to decorate the islands, the six islands in Biscayne Bay. That was nice. That, that was a beautiful really, project, really nice. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. But that was legal. <laughs> it was, I'm saying, yeah, it, exactly. It was legal. They loved it. The yes. Miami Herald gave him a rave editorial and everything. That was marvelous. Uh, I think I got to see it from an airplane. Uh, yeah, as I flew out. Not right. all of it, but I, mm -hmm. I got a glimpse of it as the plane was flying out. That was really a nice... I, thought, I was skeptical at first, but that was a nice project. However, he had all the help he wanted because it was legal. You had to bring your help in from Algeria and everything. Australia. Yeah. You see, uh, the couple of years previous, the World Trade Center, I was doing an illegal walk, almost improvised, between the pillars of the largest steel arch bridge on Earth, the Sydney Harbour Bridge in Sydney, Australia. And I found a few friends, and I flew them in <laughs> to help me in the New York caper. Um, Anyway, this, the World Trade Center also is not a mountain I want to lean on all my life. It happened, and actually right after, any, many other mountains came along. Um, so I, I, I did, for example, a few months ago, uh, a show in front of the Eiffel Tower, um, commissioned by the Ministry of Culture from France, who said after 10 years we better get this French guy back and say he's ours, you know? Yeah, exactly. That I'm going to become American soon. That's, oh, you're going to become an American soon? No, 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 but I mean... Uh, that they were you afraid know. you were. I yes. See. Well, I remember a lot of good things happened to you after that. First of all, you served the most unusual sentence in the history of New York. I mean, jail is not an unusual sentence. A fine is not an unusual sentence. Do you remember what they made you do? Well, they couldn't really decently hung me or cut my head like French would have done. But um, first, I didn't kill anybody. And secondly, um, half of the population uh, were applauding and the other half were saying, this guy is a hero. And the little half somewhere, I see there's always three halves, were saying that's a crime and he should be punished for his crime. So I was, in the, in the meantime, in the front pages, of course, <laughs> and uh, I was released very quickly from the psychiatric examination, from but did the they court, say, no, from the jail. They say Absolutely. The psychiatric well, exam this is America. Know. We are first to that. prove that you're not crazy, so we could really nail you. Oh, I forgot that. <laughs> so I'm yeah. crazy, I have an excuse. <laughs> and obviously I was not crazy, but I was very thirsty and very tired, and that was the result of the examination. This man is very sane, but very thirsty and very tired. So. Um, the uh, politics of it were that uh, you better use me instead of uh, killing me. And the district attorney, actually Mr. Q at the time, was saying, uh, would you agree, Mr. Petit, to do some kind of appearance in one of our park, and then uh, everybody will be happy. Now, I must say the true story is that those people had in mind that I will, at the bottom of a tree, juggle three oranges in front of ten kids and Channel 7 will show it. Fine. My idea was very different. I point at the most beautiful place of Central Park, which is, to me, the Belvedere Lake and the castle, and I say there, 
and all the press was behind me and they said there what and i said there an immense walk and they said no 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 we want you to do a small thing and i said oh no that would be the walk and the whole locomotive of the press forced it to exist if not they would have oh, say wow. go to your tree and juggle three your wrenches uh, so they wanted to use me and i used them and actually everybody was very happy but that's a true story uh, every broadcaster will know what i'm talking about now and, and most public speakers you see thank god you did not fall you did not almost fall which would have given me a heart attack even if i'd learned about it when you were safely back down i want to talk about the rescued fluff a fluff means we say something wrong, get a name wrong, or a phone number wrong in a commercial, or just simply gag and, and have to go back and repeat the words. Every broadcaster and every public speaker knows the feeling of being about to fluff, of almost fluffing, and catching yourself in time. It's a magic, subtle nuance, you understand? I understand. When we get back together, I want to know if you had... And a, any near fluff, if you felt any near fluff in your feet, in your knees, in your, in your anywhere as you were walking from one of the... What's the distance between one tower it's and the other? It's 200 feet. 200 feet. It's not an enormous walk, but, oh, at but it's almost height. a foot. No, it's two-thirds of a football field. Yes, and it becomes immense at this Two-thirds. In other words, in football, if your man catches the ball on his goal line and runs down to the 33, that's considered a long run. So this was, of course, a very long walk. When we get back together, I want to know if you felt the beginning of a fluff at any well, point. Hold it, hold it. We'll get right back. Mm -hmm. First... I'm Barry Farber. Let me read a little bit from P Philippe Petit's very beautiful, artistic, sensitive, uplifting book, Philippe Petit on the High Wire. It says, this is a book of instructions to those who will dare one day the impossible to walk straight into the skies and reach the stars. It shows the art to fill and illuminate the void, a void between two towers, two edges of a ravine or two planets or the space between heart and mind. A wire connects what would have been separated in loneliness forever. So I met him as a street juggler, later knew him as a high wire international daredevil hero and now a sensitive French poet, Philippe Petit. Actually, I should interrupt you and say the words we just heard were not mine. They were from Werner Herzog, the German movie maker who did oh, Fitzcarraldo. Oh, mm. you're right. Okay. But, too but bad. that is great because I gave him the back cover of the book and he said what he thought about the book. So actually, if we had to read an excerpt of the book, I would have pulled out this one. Okay. We made a great okay. choice. Okay. And, um, All right. Correction and apologies <laughs> from France to Germany and from America <laughs> to Werner Herzog. <laughs> Anyhow, you were up there. Uh, was it a windy day? If, if, if it were windy, you'd have called it off. Yes, you? and you were just asking me about a possible slight hint you, of mistake. Do you know what a fluff is? Est-ce que vous savez qu'est-ce que c'est que c'est que ça comme fluff? Yes, now I know. It's it's a. Uh, it's the, the misstep, uh, yes, uh, yes. the feeling of an upcoming right. mistake. Now, on the high wire, it will mean simply losing your life. And I am here to talk about no, it. No, no, so no, no. It happen, you use your life if you fluff. Actually, you feel a fluff coming on okay. that you avert. I want to know if so you had did an anxious, I? I want to know if you had an anxious step on that high wall. Uh, yes, I did. And actually, everyone is very surprised when I say that during those nine years of illegal uh, organization to put a wire the Twin Towers, not once, not one minute, did I thought about the walk itself. The work itself was a small detail, I would say almost a joke, let's not even talk about it. How do you bring five tons of equipment at the top of the two most guarded buildings in the biggest city in the world? That's a problem. The work, the work is uh, inconsequential. Actually, after all those nine years, one uh, <laughs> August morning, I found myself in front of that work, because then the organization was finished, the cable existed. And here I grabbed the pole, and here suddenly I realized that I never thought about what's going to happen. So the first step, putting my right foot on the cable and ungluing my left foot from uh, the building, that's uh, the very first step, uh, was a life uh, commitment of the most beautiful kind and of the worst kind. I was not prepared for it. Also, I have not slept for three days and not eaten all that you will see in the film, if the film ever exists one day. So I start on the wire, and as I walk along, my face start lightening and I actually uh, you would see in the photograph I have a big smile in the middle of the wire because that was easy. It was nothing. 
this wire was beautiful and I was very happy. But as I walk along, <laughs> I realize another unknown was about to, to grab my throat. It was the enormous space in between the Twin Towers. This is no man's land. Man is not made to go uh, uh, on a fire uh, on underneath the earth and to play uh, at a quarter of a mile in the air like birds. So here I am at the very center of the wire, which represents a frightening point for every wire walker because it's a point of non-return. It's a point where technically the cable moves the most, and it's a point where you can be aggressed by the space. Well, I was. <laughs> and here I was really fighting for my life and fighting for my balance in the middle of that wire. Then um, there was actually a real moment where a few times I, I had uh, the hint of an upcoming mistake. And that was, I also must say that most people think I just did walk across as if I wanted to have my name in a book of records. Well, no, since I am more of a theater person, I wanted to perform, and I did, and it involved seven crossing, and I stayed one hour on the cable. Wait, seven? Cross seven crossing. I didn't count them. Some onlookers says, oh, he crossed seven times. You and went it was back and forth. Absolutely. I didn't know that till no, right now. I didn't want to say I did it and I walked across. I wanted to perform. That was my stage. So I did seven crossings, and among the seven crossings, I lay down, oh. I kneel, I did all kind of figures. Of course, I was a quarter mile away from the people looking at me, and it was must have been a very strange show, but I did. Now, each time I would walk toward the tower, 120 seconds after my first step, the police was there. Very efficient. They took a special elevator. So I couldn't get on that tower. So I had to do a turnabout, a half a turn, a U-turn. <laughs> so I did. Now, one thing in my technical ability on the high wire is that I'm not very good at U-turns. <laughs> So here I am, a quarter of a mile in the air, having not rehearsed on the cable for months because I just life was like that. I was not hired. The, I was preparing the World Trade Center walk. During my first half a turn, which was kind of okay. Now, to me, technically, I have two or three kind of way of turning. And the safest one was not good for that technical one, so I used the unsafe one, the one that I have to actually kneel down and crouch around and turn. It's not very good to look at, but it's, it was the one I could control. But a few times, my balancing pole almost went to 45 degree angle, you see? Anyway, that day I did my six half a turn perfectly, and I get off the wire and I jump into the front pages. But the interesting little warning came a week later, when I was doing the sentence of the court, which was, as I explained, my first high wire walk above Central Park, legal this time, or let's say half legal since I forced myself in. Now, on that wire, which was inclined, there, I did a whole little um, presentation, and at some point I did the same half a turn, the one I have done six times at the World Trade Center the week earlier. And in this one, I failed. Oh. I didn't fall, but I failed it, and you know what happened? The balancing pole completely turned around the wire, and without understanding, I found myself like a bat hanging from the knees and from one oh hand my Lord. from the wire above Belvedere Lake, and that's not really uh, fresh water. And then my other hand was holding a 45-pound balancing pole. Now, my friends knew that's it. The one who knew I had trouble with that turn and the one who knew the weight of the pole, they just knew that physically I would not be able to bring back my body on that wire and to bring back the balancing pole back on this cable. And I knew myself I will not because in practice when this happened, I just cannot. I dropped the pole and I jumped to the floor 20 feet below. Well, here I was, uh, you know, 60 feet in the air, 15,000 people watching me and millions through the television. I don't know how and I don't know why, but I find the nervous strength of throwing this balancing pole back on the cable, turning like a monkey, and finding myself back there. So that's the kind of they little thing. They probably thought you did that. Oh, they applauded. They thought you great, did it. You know. the, they thought that was of part course, of the act. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so usually to answer your question about little warnings like that, they come after. One day I turn back and I say, oh, I was very close. But usually on the high wire, I don't have those hints. And the mistakes are fatal in the sense that if you place your feet wrongly a quarter of an inch, you're not here to talk about it. But that's the nature of high wire walking, and actually that's the beauty of it, is that you carry your life in your hands. I'm all a Pringle. My knees feel that queasy feeling like when I'm giving blood or something. Ooh, what a... What a, a thrill, even this many years later, and even knowing the outcome. Uh, did you wear a net? Or, or did, did, did you have a net under the wall? Well, illegal walks, you cannot have no, nets. No, 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 I mean in, in Central Park. No, no, no. I, I always work with no protection. Not as a choice, actually. Just because I never ask myself the question. You see, I am a kid climbing a tree. 
and I, you don't put mattress underneath a kid climbing a tree, or he will run away to another tree and say, leave me alone. So to me, getting on the highway is an act of passion and an act of, of theater and joy, and I don't want any little uh, you know, uh, artificial frame. Actually, again, I say what is beautiful is a man on a wire, putting your life there. That's inspiring. Can you imagine <coughs> the trouble New York City would have been in if, God forbid, you'd had a fatal fall? Well, what about uh, my in, trouble? In, in <laughs> cent- no, in Central Park? No, yeah, your trouble, of course, but you asked for it. I mean, sen- can you imagine if they had sentenced you? That would have been mm-hmm. capital, uh, unauthorized capital punishment for, for a, a very small crime. <laughs> Did that thought ever occur to you? Well, no, that's, that's not my problem again. Uh, and I think that uh, we live in a time where people are much too safety-oriented. And actually, uh, some, at times, in my profession, I have trouble with that, f- with that uh, question. People would say, well, we'd love to have a high walker, but what if? And I answer, that's the nature of my profession. Then uh, you would not do anything in life if you would say, what if? You will build a bridge, but what if it collapses in 20 years? Don't, break, don't be, break, build it. Right. So I asked you this the day after you made your walk. I didn't believe your answer then. I'm going to ask you again, and I'm not going to believe your answer now. But the question is going to be, Philippe, you're a lovely young person. You speak languages. You're an artist. You're a performer. You can do everything on the ground safely. Why do you go up there and risk your life time after time after time after time? First, I'm Barry Farber and Philippe Petit, the man who conquered not just New York but America and the world when illegally using friends from North Africa and Australia strung a tightrope wire between the two towers of the World Trade Center and walked across. I didn't know until right now. I'm a poor witness to history. I knew Philippe Petit before that. He was a street juggler and performer on a unicycle. But I didn't dream he had that in mind. Wow, what a moment. I'll never forget that, walking between the two towers of the World Trade Center. It's all between covers of his book, Oh, back, back and forth seven times. I didn't realize until right now. Did you wind up on the on the opposite tower from the one you started? Or no, s- you I wound was up on the same tower. Yes. How close to the opposite tower did you get? Uh, the first crossing, the police was not yet there. It was at seven or one in the morning before the workers also come to work. So that first crossing, I actually get onto the. So you uh, did the touch side. the other tower. Oh yes, and, and I then walk back. And I run back and check all the equipment that my friends had set. Then I went back on it and I started my show, which was six crossings, so seven altogether. So Philippe Petit did that, and now he's got a beautiful book, Makes the Soul Pringle. Philippe Petit, On the High Wire, On the High Wire, published by Random House. Philippe, why do you risk your life? I do not. I do not risk my life. Uh, To me, working on the high wire is part poetry and part uh, precise scientific knowledge of what you're doing and knowing yourself i hate risk takers i disrespect stuntmen who want to prove that they are the strongest and the highest and all this what i want to do is to inspire people and to express myself as an artist which i do in many other ropes than on the high wire Uh, i draw i write all those things now on the high wire I do not believe that there is risk. I believe that it's a dangerous profession, but I believe that if you put your wire yourself, which I always do with some help, and if you know your limits, which I believe I do, um, I am within a very safe uh, frame. If it's too windy, I go to see a nice movie. If the wire is not finished to rig, I say to the 4,000 people, wait, and I finish rigging it. Um, If my balancing pole breaks in the middle of the wire, I, I have plenty of reflexes, um, and of knowledge of my limits and of the limits of my craft. So actually, I am. when people see point at a dot in the sky, they say, he's crazy, he's mad. Well, actually, frankly, you have to be the contrary of crazy, the contrary of mad, the opposite. You have to really precisely know and be wise. So I'm not taking risk. You say you're not taking a risk. <laughs> you uh, accept you that. You are a poet. <laughs> no, uh, if, let's say I write a poem right here in this room. The only risk I take is going to be a bad poem, and nobody's going to like it, nobody's going to want to buy it, nobody's going to want to read it, nobody's going to want to hear it when I read it. Your risks are a little higher when you're walking between the two towers. Uh, I disagree. I think that a good poet should be in a, in a, in a, um, should be in, 
like he feels that he will die, die in his artistry, die in his pride, die, die in, the, in his art if he does a wrong poem. In the same way, a carpenter that does a wrong furniture should feel he's dead. Right. In the same way, an actor on stage that in Shakespeare completely blurbs out should die on stage. So, yes, there is a physical difference. He will not be brought to the hospital oh, okay. <laughs> if he says to oh, be or to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank but you, Philippe. I was going to ask you, no, please, to comment qualitatively on the two different kinds of dying. One, uh, <laughs> from the far by falling from a high wire from the top from a quarter mile up in the air, and the other to writing a bad poem. Well, but very frankly, I'm not playing with words by saying that to me it is the same. Uh, yes, it's physically not the same, but it should be the same in, in art. Actually, it is very beautiful, I think, to end your life living. I mean, I am a wire walker. Um, very and, young one. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm 35 uh, soon. And um, I wish, as I say in my book, in the chapter of fear, that is a chapter on falling also. Um, and I say, I say, when I hear that a wire walker fell, and that's a very harsh judgment. I say he got what he deserved. Uh, now, that is not... You say that about I our say that in a, fall? in a philosophical way. I say that I wish to end my life living. And since my life is to walk on a wire, I wish to end my life on the high wire. Now, that's, there is a lot of beauty about that. It's not a uh, death wish at all. And um, I, I really think this is uh, essential to... <laughs> Age Understand 35, that. the age of 35 is very young for some things and very old for others. When we get back together, I want to know the age of retirement. Uh, uh, what does a tightrope walking French poet philosopher think is the proper age for a tightrope walker to retire? First, Philippe Petit, this is a sophisticated question. I have often wondered. What if, you know these computer games, a computer can tell you if you're flying a plane right and when something goes wrong, you know, and you're sitting right there behind a computer. Also the driving, you can put a quarter in machines and do these driving computer games, right? So let's say there were a tightrope computer game where there's a 200 foot strip outdoors and I, Barry Farber, and <laughs> sneak, what kind of shoes do you wear? Shoes are not, uh, not important, but um, most of the time bare feet uh -huh, and okay. uh, often little ballet slipper you can feel uh, the wire. Okay, suppose I put on ballet slippers and there's uh, a, a, an imaginary rope. There's a rope painted, but it's a wired rope. It, it, it's, it's, it's a computerized rope. Mm -hmm. And the rope will tell me whether I walked successfully those 200 feet at the height of a quarter mile mm -hmm. or not. There's no risk whatsoever. The only risk is if I make a false move, the computer is going to go uh, and, and let me know that I've fallen. Uh, you know, and love loudly. Fortunately, in fiction, do you think right now I could do that tight rope walk? I don't mean perform or anything, but do you think I could make it standing up from one, uh, from from the beginning of that two hundred feet to the other on the ground? Of course not. Of course no, not. No, uh, of course not. It it takes a long physical and mental preparation to become a high wire artist or to become a high wire balancing man. Uh, just the act of balancing. Um, I also would say that uh, stay away from computer when you talk about arts because uh, that's my personal feeling that they don't mix at all and uh, our s the sickness of our uh, epoch now is to try to put everything into little tags and this computer is the epitome of that. So you cannot never a computer will write poetry that's that's the conclusion of what I want to say um, and also to me as I say in my book this balance is not the high wire walking is not the answer to the question of balance you see I came to the high wire because of my love of climbing trees because of my love of looking at the ground from above because of my uh, disregard for authority because of my love for all the arts and sports blended so that was it's interesting is his passion the technique with all well all well will follow and um, it's not the contrary it's not learn the technique and you'll become somebody who has mm. something to say oh. Philippe, how old do you think a tightrope walker should be before he says, okay, now I'm just <laughs> going to write and watch? I cannot talk for others and I cannot give recipes. I only can open my heart and this question is very interesting because to me, I don't have a career. I'm not a wire walker and I will live my life on a high wire as long as I live my life. So you will see me at 90 years old street juggling where you first met me 11 years ago as you will see me at 95 years old on a high wire. Now, of course, I won't be as 
you know, moving as now, but I will just change my way of moving. And as long as I walk on the ground, I'll be able to walk on the high wire. So I will never retire from my life. It's a beautiful picture on the front cover of a beautiful book, a beautiful shot of a truly beautiful man, Philippe Petit. The title of his book, On the High Wire, is published by Random House. And everybody can say, I know Philippe Petit. I know him by his acts. I'm one of the few people who can say, I knew him and liked him before the act. Philippe Petit, On the High Wire. I'm Barry Farber. Keep asking questions.